So I sent you that ad for KFC. Did you see that yes. ad? <laughs> yeah. Do you want to just watch it right yeah. now? Again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'd lo- okay, I need to c- calm down a little bit. Okay. <laughs> it's coming. Here, here you go. Ah. <laughs> and now, a soothing sound to calm your mind this mindfulness day. As you relax into it, fill your senses. Yes. Enjoy the gentle sound of deep frying chicken. <laughs> this is the best transition. That's right. <laughs> Pretty relaxing, huh? Rain. Chicken. Rain. Chicken. Rain. Chicken. And there's more where that came from. So, take another breath and just chill out with the sounds of Kentucky Fried Chicken. KF Chill. Finger licking good vibes. That is exactly what I needed. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. The rain or the chicken? Both. Welcome back to the Modern Lady Podcast. You're listening to episode 128. Hi, I'm Michelle. And I'm Lindsay. And today we are talking about comfort creators. It's a big world out there, but it's also a big world in here, in our phones, in our computers and laptops. And we access and connect to so much through social media and the internet. Online presence and its usage is a hot topic today for many reasons, not all of them positive or pleasant. But there is a corner of the internet that is wonderful, and it is on the rise. Enter with us now into the world of comfort creators. But first, the best way that you can support the Modern Lady Podcast is by giving us a rating and review on whatever app you use to listen to podcasts. Your reviews, especially on iTunes, can really help others who might be interested find our podcast too. Your comments mean the world to us. This week's shout out goes to Framboise22, who sent us a message on Instagram and said, quote, I just wanted to thank you for another great episode. I look forward to listening to you both every week. Listening is like sitting with good friends, having a cup of tea. Your insights and research give me hours or days of new thoughts to mull over. I truly appreciate your work, end quote. Well, thank you so much at Framboise22 for sending us such a lovely comment. It makes us so happy to hear that you not only enjoy tuning in, but that you also mull over the topics for a time afterwards too. We do the exact same thing. And if you would like to leave us a comment, you can do so on our website, www.themodernlady1950.wordpress.com, or you can leave us a comment on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube, where you can find us at The Modern Lady Podcast. But before we get into today's chat, Lindsay has our Modern Lady Tip of the Week. Spring is officially in the air. Well, I wrote that last night. We woke up to snow this morning, but let's stick with the spring thing. And this got me thinking about the exterior of my house and well, the exteriors of many houses. And I started to wonder if there was any correlation between the homeowner's personality and the color they paint their houses. I found a great article on apartmenttherapy.com titled, here's what your exterior house color says about you pretty straightforward so let's jump right in and let's start with red if you've been watching jonah jenton on youtube you might also be drooling over the traditional red homes in sweden they're just gorgeous against the snow and stand out in the summer in the green grass against the blue sky well according to this article if you paint your house red then you are classic it goes on to say that you know what looks good and you stick with it you're also drawn to antiques and a more traditional and simple life Ah, yellow is next. Now my parents' cottage is simply called the Yellow House. And if you've chosen yellow for your home, you're energetic and had entertaining in mind as you were house hunting. You're bright, cheerful, and you love sharing your boundless energy with others at parties. Charcoal. Dark houses are really trendy right now. 
Ah, but don't tell the person who chose charcoal this. According to this article, they'd rather call themselves stylish than trendy. People who choose this dark and bold color are known to take calculated risks that have paid off in the past. Now, white. You're traditional. It's clean and straightforward and paired with something like black shutters, it's timeless. Just like you. No games, just clean, classic, and easy to understand. What about a tan home? You're calm and you like to play it safe. This article on apartmenttherapy.com is cheering you on though and reminding you that playing it safe is totally fine. That craving stability is very natural. And now brown. You're an old soul. You love vintage and shag carpets and avocado appliances and all those retro filters on Instagram. But wait, what about brick? Well, according to this article, you are reliable. You are loyal, trustworthy, and someone that everyone can lean on. You, my friend, are someone of great quality. Mm, okay, I love I love this. This was a personality <laughs> test within a tip of the week, and I couldn't be more thrilled. <laughs> did you pass? Where I was like, I, I did won. Pass. <laughs> well, I I've typed myself, <laughs> so I have a white exterior with brick. Mm, very cool. So I'm so I'm a dependent. I'm a dependable traditional person. Yeah. I think. Yeah. But what happens if you didn't choose your house color? Because I just haven't changed it from the people who actually chose those things. But you still (laughs) chose the house to buy. I thought about that too, because mine is tan and I am not calm and I don't like to play it safe. (laughs) (laughs) So I was reading that like this one wasn't right. But we did choose this house. It still appealed to Mm. me. So maybe that's still within me somewhere. But then I thought about the whole color psychology behind like front doors when people paint their front doors. Right. So I mean, yes. this could continue on next week, friends. I know. <laughs> Door colors coming yes. up next. <laughs> and I was going to say, if we wanted to delve into your tan house a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It could be that you, it appealed to you um, that home is your haven. Like it's ah, a safe yes. place. So it's yes. not like playing it safe, but you saw it as a safe place. That is very true. So, Lindsay. Yeah, yeah, Michelle. I'm going to just like tone my voice down a little bit and okay. read my intro like this because yeah. we're going to lead into the comfort creator content. Yeah. And I do feel like our usual energy um, provides a bit more of a stark contrast to our right. content okay. today. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. It sounds great. Okay. We've all heard the term comfort foods, the things we eat when we want to feel that cozy, warm feeling. What is so interesting is that we now can access that cozy, warm feeling in a way we never have been able to before, all thanks to the internet, social media, and the rise of comfort creators. Right, Lindsay? That's right, Michelle. Now, I asked people on Instagram what their favorite comfort creator accounts are, and many of them said us, Michelle, which shocked me because I think I'm a screaming banshee half the time (laughs) that you edit and bring down my volume. No? No. (laughs) So we're trying really hard right now to like Mm. live up to the wonderful honor of being, um, what are we, Michelle? (laughs) We keep, we want to call ourselves comfort, cr- right. comfort creators. Not yeah. creature comforts, yeah. like I keep thinking the word is. <laughs> so we can't do it much longer than this, but I, I can't. Just, yeah. No, we can't do it. So here we are. Yay. Um, you guys can just turn down the volume if you want. You can slow us down on your listening app. <laughs> yeah. Oh, know. yes. Right? I guess we apologize if you had to turn us up there for a minute. <laughs> And now we're back. Yelling. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we are so sorry. Now, I think sometimes, and even on this podcast, we can be a little too harsh when we judge the internet. Now, obviously, mm. it can get dark and dangerous and downright evil on there. But today, mm. we're going to focus on, like you said, that wonderful little corner, which is growing rapidly bigger <laughs> over the mm. last two years of lovely channels and creators who are making comforting content. And we didn't even realize how big this genre was until we started talking about it. And so this is just really, again, like two friends talking about all of the stuff that we like taking in, but also like why we all seem to enjoy it and why this genre has massively grown in the, in the last two years. Mm -hmm. And how it's always kind of been there. 
you know, in in the wings, we've talked about the precursors to what we would now term officially comfort creators, right? Um, And how we've always kind of turned towards comforting things in times of stress or whenever we need to relax and unwind. But that this very deliberate and intentional creation of this content has really boomed over the last few years. And that's what we find so fascinating about it. So what are comfort creators? Well, I first heard about this term last week and I was listening to the Under the Influence podcast with Joe Piazza. And it pleased me greatly when I found out that there's an actual term for something that I and you, Michelle, that we consume frequently. So comfort Mm -hmm. creators. Even the term just seems to um, create like an emotional response within me, right? Comfort. Isn't that just the most precious word? Yeah. I was just going to say, putting the word comfort with anything, Mm -hmm. uh, even by that gives you comfort. So you think of even like saying comfort foods, you automatically feel better, right? And yeah, yeah, so like even the, the word comfort meaning to, you know, ease or alleviate a person's feelings of distress or the state of physical ease. Um, It's one of those words, what are those words called where they sound like what they are um, spelled like? Onomatopoeias. Is that what it, yes, onomatopoeias. It's almost kind of like an onomatopoeia. Yeah, yeah. If you think of it, comfort. Yeah. So comfort creators are the people who create content that people turn to when they need something comforting, something relaxing. They use different mediums, podcasting, producing YouTube videos, Instagram, TikTok, uh, Twitch. We'll talk actually a bit more about Twitch later. Uh, On Twitch, they're called comfort streamers. Okay, so here's the thing. Watching comfort content is the antidote to doom scrolling and hate following, which are other (laughs) things that people have found themselves doing. Um, You know, even the most wonderful people uh, have been caught up doom scrolling. Uh, What is doom scrolling? It is our tendency to continue to scroll through or surf through bad news, even though we know that it makes us sad, angry, depressed, and even fall into despair. Now, why do we do this? Our brains love this stuff. According to Ken Yeager, a psychiatrist at Ohio State University, we are hardwired to seek out and consume negative things because from an evolutionary standpoint, knowing all that could cause us danger could help us survive. Now, we have fooled ourselves into thinking that if we can just find out more, more, more details, right? Keep reading, keep reading, keep reading, keep scrolling about the bad things happening, then we can increase our chances of being safe. But that's just not the case with the internet. It's very different than in the past when you needed to know local worries that were like impending, you know, that could impact your family. Mm -hmm. Um, It's a false sense of control that has the opposite effect. It causes massive anxiety. So this, you know, it's it's quite obvious that this is the answer. Comfort scrolling is 100% the answer. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense because our brains were not ever designed to hold like the doom scrolling of the entire planet yes, right? yes, every single day. I know what you're saying. It was like a survival mechanism that kicked in yeah. um, in the very imminent dangers that surrounded us. And, you know, in a way, I think our, our propensity then to seek out comfort uh, content online is also a survival mechanism too, that when you feel that stress or that fear, I think it's primal for us to go looking for the things that are going to ease it. Like if the immediate danger has passed or we've even subconsciously assessed that the danger we're reading about is not imminent, is not close by, then we need something to like take us down a level. And so I can totally see how all these things kind of play and work with our natural instincts. Yes. And a lot of you have already heard, and I think we've even talked about this in a past episode, about the um, studies that were released uh, maybe about a year ago about how everybody was choosing to like rewatch TV shows that they've already seen and movies when the pandemic Mm -hmm. was first starting and how they immediately understood that that was um, very calming for people, that if you know what's going to happen, you can enjoy it, but it really takes away that unease of going and uncertainty um, that we were feeling in our outside lives. And so 
So there was a lot mm. of rewatching of TV shows. And that was the kind of one of the beginnings of this comfort viewing. And then con- content creators started taking that same thing and, and like creating new materials that went beyond us just rewatching The Office over and over again. Like that's usually the show most referenced for comfort watching. Mm-hmm. So it turns out that the word comfort is one of the three most popular themes on YouTube in 2022, according to YouTube's culture and trends team. The other two trending themes are creativity and community. The three Mm -hmm. C's, comfort, creativity, and community. I really like that. Those three things, it completely makes sense, right? When you think about what's gone on in the last two years. Now, according to an article on thinkwithgoogle.com, Quote, from a marketing standpoint, these global insights can help brands understand what people are looking for and how best to reach them, end quote. So it only makes sense that after everything we've been through on a global scale, comfort and community is something that we're all looking for when we connect to the world via the internet. And then, of course, brands are going to find ways to utilize that, which is the (laughs) amazing commercial that you had in the cold open, Michelle. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) I love that so much. I did not see it. Well, I did kind of see it because it's KFC. But when they (laughs) flip back and forth, I'm like, Yes. yes. That is a smart use of a comfort ploy, like a comfort technique to bridge it into marketing and advertising. And that really Mm -hmm. links with the third C, creativity. So creativity really jumped out at me because it does seem like more and more people are creating new and exciting content thanks to the multiple sharing platforms that are available now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I find the, the rise of this content really interesting timing with the pandemic. Right. Yeah. And especially to like um, even what comfort content tends to be about, yeah. like the tasks themselves are very comforting, very relaxing. Um, and I think that some of the more popular ones, too, are everyday things that everyone else is doing or can access or it's familiar to us. Mm -hmm. So yeah, at a time when we were both very isolated and spending more time at home, the rise of the comfort content seemed to show people that where they are right now um, can also be beautiful and relaxing. And like, you didn't need to kind of go outside yourself to procure a different lifestyle. We couldn't, right? Those things would have been maybe more stressful, but the comfort content really focused on like what we all have right now and how do we appreciate and notice them and acknowledge them and are more aware of them in a way that positively benefits us. Yeah, that's definitely one aspect. There's so many different types of comfort videos and comfort yeah. content. Um, one of them, you're right, is just everyday items. We'll talk more about like cleaning comfort videos later or like cooking or baking and all those ones. And then there's a bunch of other ones we're going to touch on as well. These content creators talk about wanting to produce content that relaxes people and or cheers them up. And I just love that. Like they are being mm. intentional about what they're creating. Now, one such creator named Caitlin Galamega age 24, was interviewed in a New York Times article titled, What is a Comfort Creator? And she said that being called a comfort creator is the biggest compliment in the world. People tell her that they turn to her videos on YouTube and TikTok when they're feeling down. And I kept reading the words cozy vibe. And isn't that like cozy Mm. vibe is just everything people really turn to over the last two years. Everything from, you know, sweatsuits becoming huge. Like we were dressing cozy, like you were saying, comfort food. We've even seen this in our spring uh, trends episodes Mm -hmm. we've talked about. Um, And it just makes sense that it's our continuing obsession with Huga, right? Like it's like, it's like Huga in video form and we are so here for it. Hmm. Yeah, I've like in terms of like the home comfort creators, mm-hmm. I saw one article. Um, I think it's another New York Times article. This one's called Lessons from a Homebody. Mm. They described it as Danish Huga meets Marie Kondo. Oh, <laughs> yes. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Almost like, I don't think there's anything like both of those things are comfort in and of themselves. And then you put them together and you oh. have this explosion of comfort content. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I love that so much. And so then I started to think about, okay, what about our kids? So I asked my 13 year old son about comfort creators and he immediately knew what I was talking 
talking about. And I didn't mm. think he would. Yeah. I, I, I thought I'd have to explain it to him. And he told me that um, when he comes home from school, he knows which YouTubers he wants to watch if he needs to relax. Like he has some go-tos. Mm. And so he talked about one, um, and I've watched it with him, a channel called Aperture. And they're educational videos that take like deep dives into really interesting topics. So the topics are like a little philosophical or heavy, but the way it's produced is very relaxing. His voice is very relaxing. Um, it, it's calm images, images. It slowly unfolds. And yeah, um, my son's favorite ones are his shower thoughts videos. And he also talks mm. about like neuromarketing and the paradoxes of life. Um, and then this sparked a further conversation with my son and I, and we both agreed that video game streaming can also be really relaxing. And then we realized like, that's mm. just why so many young people are watching it. Cause I used to think, why are you watching other people play video games? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I do actually look more into that and we'll talk about that in a second. But we talked about Minecraft and how my kids have been playing Minecraft and watching others play Minecraft for almost 10 years now and they're mm -hmm. still not sick of it and we really believe that that started with Minecraft it is an incredibly relaxing game to yeah. watch other people play <laughs> yeah and honestly that's what my kids watch right now yeah. too um either Minecraft or I know what you're saying because they'll also watch um Super Smash Brothers mm -hmm. other people playing Super Smash Brothers which in and of itself is not a relaxing game Right. Like it's very flashy. Right. Um, but they, they love, they, they just, I can tell, like if I'm thinking back to noticing how they're sitting, what their demeanor is, they are just chilling out, yeah. um, watching these tutorials and watching other people build things in Minecraft. Like that really would be considered comfort watching for them. Yeah. So Let's just discuss briefly an overview of some other types of comfort viewing, um, just so people can really understand what we're talking about here. So um, I've talked before in the podcast about my love of like the 4K walking videos where no one's mm. talking. They're just really good quality and you hear the sound of the feet in the snow or the feet on the cobblestones. Um, you and I love Jonah Jinton. Her videos are for sure uh, mm. cre um, comfort creator videos. Um yep. We got the ambiance videos. Again, I, it was one of my, what I was loving, I don't know, probably a year ago. Love, love an ambiance video still. <sighs> Another one that we've been using a lot in our house is I'll just look up French cafe music or um, Italian cafe music. And sometimes you hear ambient noises in the back. But they'll often have just pretty photography on the screen. Um, it's different than a playlist to me because they're set up. Mm -hmm. To t like to give a whole a cozy vibe when it's on your TV, right? It's not just an like ambiance. An ambiance. An ambiance. Yeah. Well, it's not <laughs> an ambiance video. These are different oh, than ambiance okay. videos. Oh, they're different. Okay. Yeah, and then there's a whole slew of slow living vlogs, slow living content creators, um, on Instagram and on YouTube. Um, one example is a YouTube channel called Apron Full of Stones. Um, mm. I was telling you about her right before we logged on, right? And and like, mm -hmm. guys, listen to these titles. She has one video called Comfort Food and Cozy Vibes. And the other one is Heartwarming Wholesome Christmas Vlog on Cozy Christmas Eve. And it's like she just <laughs> tapped into wow. all of our favorite words yeah. there. <laughs> <laughs> if there was ever a clickbait keyword, yes. <laughs> like compendium for what would get me to click on a video, that would be high. <laughs> yeah. You've got like gardening videos. You've mm. got homesteading. Um, again, we'll talk talk about how these are like traditionally like almost feminine type chores, tasks, duties, but how they've been elevated. And it's something that you and I've been pushing like just ourselves to elevate our own daily duties um, over the mm -hmm. last couple of years and talking about so often as a theme on the podcast. And we're like, oh, these people are doing it. They're just filming themselves doing a lot of their chores and they just really show how beautiful it can be if you just have two candles lit beside the loaf of sourdough that you're making. Like they are filming these things, but they're, the difference is they're doing it intentionally. Like they are are creating mm -hmm. this is a created genre now yeah like they are producing things so it is different from um like an in the moment inspiration yeah. or like if you're trying to curate an actual lifestyle yeah. where you style your things like understand that many of these for a lot of these people this is like a a creative outlet and yes. passion project too so there is like lighting involved and um, props and things like that but 
I don't know. I don't care. <laughs> I'll watch no, it No, we were talking about that, yeah. right? We were talking about... So is it... Okay, so an example of somebody you and I love is Hammy Mommy. Hammy Mommy yeah. is a you know South Korean housewife. We've also talked to her about, about her before. Do I really think she wears those pleated skirts and an apron and her hair and a pretty ribboned ponytail um, every day as she's doing her cleaning? Probably not. Does it bother me that it's not like actually her authentic life? Not one bit. Like pull yeah. me into the fantasy, Hammy Mommy. Yeah. I am here with you. I want to believe that that's how you clean your house every day. And this is different than some of the influencers that we might encounter on Instagram who also are like lifestyle um, creators, Mm -hmm. right? Lifestyle content creators, lifestyle influencers. Sometimes we look at those ones and we're turned off by it. We don't find it calming. We find it irritating. We find like we get frustrated. We get jealous. We just, we don't, we don't want Um, we don't turn to that to be relaxed. Um, These Mm -hmm. people also have lives, like we're saying, that might not be true and quite staged and all set up. But there's just something about the way that they produce that content that it doesn't bother us at all. It has that complete opposite feeling and you just want to cheer them along and go along for the ride. Mm -hmm. And we've been talking around like why that could potentially be right. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Because there there does seem to be like all different um, kinds of content creators and there's Mm -hmm. a lot of gray areas where they overlap um, between creator and influencer so there's actually a really interesting article on the atlantic called the real difference between creators and influencers Mm -hmm. and i was really intrigued by this whole thing because i think that's what we're kind of talking about too right there does seem to be a difference yes and i'd like to actually just um say at the first is that i don't think either of them are bad (laughs) right yep yeah we're not casting judgment on either one of these things yeah yeah I just think they're different things and perhaps our frustrations comes from not there's no definite line separating influencer versus creator Mm -hmm. um and so sometimes we don't realize what we're getting but all this to say like where do those terms even come from this article really addresses that and it's interesting that creator the term creator was started by YouTube mm. and it started way back um, when YouTube, they wanted to mature beyond cat videos, <laughs> <laughs> which I laughed about. Uh-huh. Um, and they actually started to notice a new rising group of people who were using the platform for more specific and more produced content. So initially, they these people would go by YouTube stars. Yeah. Right. But the name was really lacking. Like no one really wanted to be called a YouTube star. Um, And YouTube wanted better for them, too, in terms of a name. So they started a grant program in 2010 for these create these content creators um, who they then called partners. Mm. And what they would do is they would advance these YouTube stars money that they would eventually be able to make from their content, but they would advance it so that it would help them invest in their channels and in Mm. their content. So while all this is going on, YouTube is recognizing they're more than just on-screen talent. These people are editors, they're producers, they're entrepreneurs. Um, As this was going on, they acquired a new company. YouTube bought a company called Next New Networks. And they had also developed a program called Next New Creators, which helped YouTube stars really get off the ground. And this is where the term creator really came from. And it was starting to be officially used to describe these YouTube stars. So ever since then, so around... 2010. After that, the term branched out to pretty much all other social media platforms. And it was such a good fit because it fit anybody who wanted to create online content. So what they were finding is too with YouTube, and we've talked about this too, we'll talk about it in a little bit, but celebrities. Mm-hmm. It, um, a celebrity could be a creator. Amateurs could be creators. Makeup artists could be creators, but also designers, but also chefs, but also musicians. Anybody could be a creator. And that's what YouTube really wanted to do is open up the playing field to anybody who wanted to create this content on their platform. So then the article starts talking about the term influencer then. Where does that come from? And what does that describe? So this article says it's uh, it often describes anyone who then uses or leverages social media to grow a following 
and then exerts influence over that following in order to make money. So again, it's not necessarily bad. It's just a different use and a purpose. Yeah. So it could be like a chef using their YouTube channel to promote a new cookbook that they wrote or a stay-at-home mom who uses her Instagram account to promote her home business mm-hmm. as an entrepreneur or a teenager using her TikTok account to do makeup tutorials um, and to you know, sell product or sell workshops or something like that in tutorials. There's just what the article was saying. There's this hierarchy of terms that have come from the creation of these names. So influencer is still seen as a bit more cringeworthy than creator. And it's possibly because of its ties to monetization. Um, There's a YouTuber that was interviewed in the article named Natasha Hines, who argues that a creator is in it for the self-expression, whereas an influencer means, and this is a quote from her, uh, quote, someone who is building a platform with the intention of being used by brands for marketing purposes, end quote. So it uh, an interesting turn right at the end of the article. They're talking about how these two things are starting to merge, though. Um, the rise of the term influencer with the diversification of social media platforms. So even though creator is still a term that's mostly linked to YouTube content, now you have creators who aren't just on YouTube. They also have um, work that is featured on Instagram, for example. And the article suggests that the term influencer um, is actually just starting to be synonymous with the sentiment of I'm not just on YouTube. Mm. So whether those two will, will continue to mesh more is interesting. But I just thought like there's a lot of talk about influencers right now. And mm-hmm. the whole world of influencing and when we're now talking today about creators and what is the difference between the two, I thought that article was a really good like primer, <laughs> like 101 <laughs> for people like me who have no idea. We just like to consume whatever is out there. Um, but to be able to start differentiating between the different kinds of content. That was the deep dive I didn't know I needed. That I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I, I know, loved it. So it. Like honestly, I was no, I was riveted. And so mm-hmm. thank you for that. And I think that I, I still when I hear the word influencer, I feel like it has a bit more of a negative tinge to it, um, other than like yeah. creator. Um, although obviously both are used to sell things. Like that's the one thing you and I talked about a lot. That right. as soon as there's any new type of medium or art form, people are gonna find ways to monetize it, right? And mm-hmm. one of the things that stood out to me though. Um, is how YouTube really from the beginning, and I don't know how they treat, I know that they have like their golden play buttons and and other um, incentives for their creators, but it seems Mm -hmm. like from the beginning as they were trying to grow, like they really put a lot of, they put their money where their mouth was, right? And supporting these yeah. creators. And I love that. And I, now that makes sense to me when on, on the Under the Influence podcast, they were talking about how Instagram has been terrible as a company for mm. its influencers and its creators that are obviously generating billions of dollars for Instagram as well, but they haven't mm-hmm. done anything to like protect these people or they keep changing the algorithms. And it's just been a much, much harder um, platform to work on as a, as a content creator. Huh. That is really interesting um, because, you know, comparing the kind of content you will find on Instagram and on YouTube, you really do go to YouTube for more long form. Yes. Or, yes. yeah, like even if a creator is on both platforms, they'll often use Instagram as a vehicle to drive traffic yeah. to their YouTube channels, right? And yeah. I didn't even think of that implication before that it's possibly because Instagram makes it very, very hard to be a creator on mm-hmm. Instagram. Another one of the like subgroups of this comfort creator world is <laughs> ASMR. And we've talked about ASMR once or twice before on the podcast. But for those of you who still don't know what it is, it stands for Autonomous Sensory Meridian Response. And it was a term coined only in 2010. Now, you will know what it is if um, if you haven't already heard of this, because it is the third most popular search on YouTube right now. Mm. And it causes something when people listen and watch these videos, it causes a feeling that is described as euphoric relaxation. 
Now, I definitely experience ASMR. And when I was researching it more, it, it turns out that people who experience it started experiencing it as a child and just thought everybody f- like feels this and didn't know until now, mm-hmm. until people are talking about it, that not everybody does. But it is, um, it's the sensation you get if someone's playing with your hair or that like tingly um, scalp thing that you can put on your scalp, that little mm-hmm. toy you can buy at bookshops. Yeah. <laughs> but it's basically, it feels like um, warm, tingly fingers opening up your spine up to like your brain stem if that makes sense Mm, and everything kind of mm -hmm. warmly and tingly opens now people are triggered to feel that from all different types of sounds it's usually things that are very soft and whispery right the tapping on a mic i don't know if i can here let me see if i can do a little asmr for you guys we'll do a little okay so i just have a picture here that my daughter drew and so it's like this and i'll go like this so they do these things or they do okay. like a role with paper? play with paper. Okay. They tap on oh. a mic like this. I don't know if you can hear me doing that. Okay. Um, yep. um, and for me, <laughs> you and I've told you this, Michelle, I, yes. it happens to me when someone's typing on a keyboard. <gasps> yes. I was going to say, I can demonstrate this one right now. Yes. Go ahead, please. Oh my gosh. I love it. <laughs> Like when we log in before we record, sometimes you're still typing up an intro, right? And you're like, so sorry, mm-hmm. I'm just finishing this. And I'm like, no problem, go on for as long as you like. And I just sit <laughs> back and I let my brain stem get all tingly. And I first noticed that long before the internet when I was at work, if I was sitting across the desk mm. from my boss who was typing. And it's, it's not just the typing. It's when they're moving papers like this, then writing okay. on a paper quick, then typing and then going back and forth. It sends me into... Well, euphoric relaxation, euphoria, yeah. euphoria. <laughs> and it's fantastic. So, um, have mm. do you experience that, Michelle? Okay, so I don't know if it's as intense. It, like I don't, I don't know if I experience euphoria, but I do feel like a tingling sensation with certain things. For me, it's like um, certain kinds of walking. Yep. Sounds, I guess. Like I yep. love hearing different walking surfaces, like slippers on hardwood floors. Mm. I really like, uh, like the shuffling. Um, I really like the crunching leaves yeah. when someone's walking through a forest. That type of ASMR is really relaxing for me. So I do, I do totally get it. And then um, part of the reason why, you know, uh, some of those silent vlogs, especially the ones that deal with homemaking. Mm-hmm. Part of the reason why I think they're so relaxing for me is because of the sounds of everyday things. Yeah, like that's what it just is. The, mm-hmm. Yeah, the water running, the crinkling of the the Packaging. produce bag. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the little things like that. So maybe maybe not always the vacuum cleaner per se, not that <laughs> kind of cleaning. Yes. But yeah, like the walking around, the swish of you know, walking past the camera or the wiping of a table or something like that. Like it's those sounds that evoke this visceral response in our bodies. Yeah. Now, neurologists are trying to look into this more because this is Mm. really, like I said, it's the third most popular search on YouTube. So people are like, okay, what's going on? So they did a small study. This is like, they're just starting to study it. And they did find um, that there was activation in the brain when ASMR was triggered um, that did light up areas of the brain um, that were involved in like empathy and something called socio-emotional bonding. Um, So I'm interested to see as they start to learn more about it. Now, Maria, she's a famous ASMR star on YouTube. She said, and I quote, we've gotten feedback from firefighters, soldiers, pilots, lawyers, single mothers, and suicidal teenagers who just watched these videos and it changed their attitude and mood for even just a few minutes. It's an amazing feeling to hear someone tell you that. Um, I think that that's incredible. And and I think, again, that we can underestimate the positive power that providing comfort content can do for people. Um, that's what I kept hearing over and over and over again from Gen Z, from the TikTok mm. um, creators, from people who are um, comfort streaming on Twitch, um, that there are a lot of teenagers in the last couple of years, obviously, with everything that's been going on, who slipped into very deep depression. And some of their lives were saved by being able to log in and connect with these people. And we'll, we'll, again, we'll go into that a little bit more about how that 
that connection is facilitated. Mm -hmm. Um, But just, I thought that was so interesting how Maria talked about that. Like you can see firefighters or, you know, I'm married to a police officer, like a way to slow their brains down. And um, I did actually come across the, the term over and over again, that it is self-soothing, right? You don't have to pay for anything. You don't have to go out of your house um, to meet with someone. Um, you, this is just a good first step to try to do to like calm our busy brains. Mm-hmm. This is such an interesting concept because when I was thinking about like how neat it is that I can hear those sounds, which are very common sounds, um, to my everyday life, but I can listen to it on YouTube and then realize that that's actually just uh, my life. Yeah. And a lot of it doesn't calm <laughs> us down when we're the ones no. doing the cooking. <laughs> but I realized that often I'm not listening to myself do those right. things. Right. Right. And so it made me kind of reflect a little bit on how often I'm either listening to a podcast or I have earbuds in, um, I'm listening to music or I'm talking to somebody on the phone or I'm talking to one of the kids or we're rushing to get to the next task. Um, and I wonder if part of the comfort is that it's, t- in a way, teaching how to live in that present moment. Yes. Yeah. You know, that as a self-soothing, self-soothing technique as well is showing us again that like, no, this is also your present moment. Yeah. Like these sounds exist in your world too. So here's what it sounds like. Notice how you feel when you pay attention to what one task is like how one task is being done and what it looks like and what it sounds like maybe the next time you're doing the same thing in your real life too you'll kind of have that moment of recognition and you'll get into the habit again of noticing the present moment in your life too yeah we can really be inspired to Mm -hmm. reframe um our everyday chores when we watch a lot of those videos now you mentioned earlier that you move your body like hammy mommy does or liziki after you watch their videos (laughs) and i do the same thing right yeah Yeah. we do it it can (laughs) impact the way you carry yourself and do your little tasks for quite a you know, a few minutes after watching those videos. Um, now this is called mimicry and researchers are just oh. finding out how mimicry is a factor in why kids and teens spend so many hours watching others play video games. So we're back to this now <gasps> okay, um, on streaming channels. Okay. So according to an mm-hmm. article on this topic on the conversation.com quote, when we were watching the action being streamed to our screens, it would be these circuits that fire up and make us feel the highs and the lows as if we, if it were us playing. This kind of passive psychological involvement is also seen with spectators of traditional sports such as football, end quote. Mm. So this got me thinking about what men watch to relax and mm. it's usually gaming and sports versus what women watched in order to relax. And we watch other women working and doing traditionally feminine chores, right? Like baking and cleaning mm-hmm. and putting on makeup. Now back to Twitch though. So Twitch is again, like a gaming streaming platform. Uh, and here's mm-hmm. another quote. It says, however, the strongest motivator for using the service by far was found to be the release of tension. Viewers sought to use the platform for escapism and diversion from their day-to-day lives. This was found to be a major driver behind the number of individual streams that are accessed in one sitting. It seems likely then that we are not only hardwired to enjoy watching other people play, particularly if we play games ourselves, but also psychologically driven to see streaming platforms as a way of fulfilling our informational, social, and escapist needs. This phenomenon creates a demand that Twitch is well-placed to supply. So, we mimic some of the behaviors. There are also people who watch the, like, especially teenagers and kids, they'll watch it to learn new tricks or skills, right? And mm. mimic, mimicry. Um, but I thought that was so neat about about um, streaming and comfort streaming. And there are streamers on Twitch, and these are teenagers, this is Gen Z, and they just, like, it's a little voyeuristic. And I can understand that there are different sides to this conversation. Um, and we're mm-hmm. not really going into that side today, but some of them just like will log in and just stream as they're doing their homework and other teenagers will join them. And they say that it is so calming for them to feel so not alone. And this is exactly what teenagers were trying to fight with all of this isolation over mm-hmm. the last couple of years. So they were starting to use these streaming services to like connect with each other just sitting in their chairs in their rooms and not doing anything horrible like just doing their homework and stuff and that they found that to be incredibly calming and again and in some cases teenagers were saying life-saving 
My goodness. Yeah, when you put it that way, you can see how important that need for connection is. Yes. Right? Like, we're so desperate for it. Um, and that these platforms give us a way to access it, especially during times when we can't in yeah. any other way. You think about a lot of, so now this has given rise to this demand of online community of like streaming, say, a study session with students. Um, that may have not been a need before the pandemic and all the lockdowns. Yeah. Right. Like they yes. would have actually been there maybe yep. in person with friends <laughs> studying. Yes. So it really, that this feeling of intimacy is a really, really big part of comfort creators. And this is what I kept coming o- I, like up against in my research over and over and over again. Um, so in that same New York times article that we mentioned before, um, they pointed out the huge difference between, Um, I guess like the love people have for something like The Office um, and people really, really love The Office, especially Gen Z. It's still like the go-to show reference is like the most comfort viewing Um, and the difference then between what comfort creators provide. And it does come down to intimacy and familiarity and um, also the amount of content that's produced, right? There's only, um, when it's a Hollywood show, (laughs) you only get like a limited amount of episodes. It costs money to produce them and you get one a week. And at that time it was like a 22 minute episode of a sitcom Uh, a lot of these these um, comfort creators especially the people who stream on twitch often are on every day they're putting something Mm. on every day so you really like a you feel like they're so familiar to you um the article says quote many of whom pump out hours of content every day while interacting directly with their viewers on social media and in the comment section of their streams unquote and this was unheard of before these types of platforms were made available. Like I can't imagine in, in 2005, um, I, I watched The Office from the very beginning, like watching that first episode and then like being able to talk to Steve Carell, like it would have never, it couldn't happen. Mm-hmm. Do you think though, The Office, if we're going to use that as an example, and I think it's a good one, mm-hmm. that The Office actually produced comfort content without even knowing it and before co- comfort content was even a thing because what is it that we're talking about? Like all these things, the ASMR, just hearing the environment. Mm-hmm. Um, the office is simple. Like yeah. it was the sounds of the office, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, it was the intimacy that we're talking about and the actors that I know they're actors, but as the characters be looking at the camera. Yeah. Yeah. Like doing their little interviews. You were there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you were there, right? You were part of that whole environment so I think it's actually so so clear why the office would be considered like a precursor to comfort content because it actually produced it before it was a thing and even really before um, this type of content hit social media in general oh yeah for sure because the whole thing is a docu- a mockumentary right it, you're you're looking through right. the eyes of the crew that are filming them for this documentary and yes. so um yeah doing like the little um i forget what they call it in that type of production where you sit off camera or like you go and just do your face-to-face little mini interviews but that mm-hmm. type of thing too and then so many of the characters there use their real names like the actor's real names are the names of the character on the show um mm. so it really did blur worlds like the, it's one of those few shows that more people than ever wish pam and jim were really married in real life like they have a yeah. big problem with john krasinski <laughs> being married to emily blunt you know, he's married to mary poppins um, <laughs> um but yeah it's um it, it's fascinating and i think that our older generation um might totally underestimate just how exciting it is for the younger millennials and gen z when they get to communicate with their favorite favorite online personalities like Mm. they do get to like talk with them my kids have been able to play video games on live streams of some of their favorites right they've like my kids Mm. names have popped up on youtube as they've been able to join in some of the games and and i think back to when i wrote uncle jesse john stamos a card asking if he would marry me when i was seven that i asked my mom to mail him and she didn't and hit it in her nightstand and i found it later devastated (laughs) about why uncle jesse wouldn't marry me um 
<laughs> and I think that if he had written back what that would have felt like and our kids right. with our parental supervision, let me be very clear on that. Like, again, we're not mm. going into all the dark side of all this stuff, but that um, our kids and our teens have this opportunity to connect with these creators in a way that we just never had the opportunity to. You had to like find their fan mail address and yes. there used to be a magazine. This will, You won't remember this magazine called Big Bopper um, in mm. the 80s. And it was a, it was like a teenage celebrity magazine and it would have like the fan mail addresses to send your <laughs> snail mail um, and you might get like an autographed picture back. But anyways, this, this intimacy, this availability, um, it, it has caught me off guard so many times because yeah, I'll watch uh, my, my favorite viewing is BBC documentaries. And I mm-hmm. have reached out to some of the presenters before on Twitter and stuff and they write right back and we can actually discuss something that they had done on the show. And I'm like, this is mind blowing. <laughs> like I can't, yes. I can't believe that we have this and it does create this sense that um of a smaller world right of a of a mm-hmm. intimacy yeah yeah that you have like a connection with that person mm-hmm. the, yeah and that you you have like you bonded in some way over this shared interest Yes. And the the woman I quoted earlier, um, Caitlin Galamega, who is a, con- a comfort content creator, she said, um, comfort shows make you do, they make you feel connected to the characters, um, but they're not real. So again, that's like the office, right? You do mm. feel connected to them, but they are characters. She says, whereas when you have content creators, they're real people and they tend to be a little bit more open about how they're feeling and you feel connected to them on a personal level. Um, mm. I also was reading that she was talking about how um, a lot are very open about like their mental health struggles. They share a lot. And so um, it creates something that is called a parasocial relationship. And mm. um, I shared this on Instagram a while ago, and it was a concept that absolutely blew my mind. Um, it's a <laughs> phenomenon that makes you feel like you really are friends with the influencers and content creators that you follow and sometimes interact with online. Um, it's kind of a one-way relationship um, that one yeah. side feels an emotional connection to, right? Um, mm-hmm. One way to think about it is if you are wondering about a certain YouTuber or Instagrammer when you're not using those apps, like have they had their baby yet? Or how's their husband doing with his health struggles? Um, Mm. The thing is, it's not exclusively one sided, because there is the chance that they will respond, um, or at least someone on their team. And sometimes that is just enough to keep you holding on to what you perceive to be an authentic relationship. Right. You know, I came across parasocial relationships, too, when I was looking into things. And again, it doesn't seem to be necessarily bad, like an inherently bad thing. Um, There were psychologists who were talking in an article I was reading that said that it it is really natural to want to bond with someone who is sharing so much about themselves and who we aspire to or are inspired by. Um, And there is one psychologist in particular, her name is Cynthia Vinny, and she specializes in media psychology. And she had an interesting quote. She said that this response doesn't mean the individuals believe the interaction is real. Despite media consumers' knowledge that the interaction is an illusion, however, their perception will cause them to react to the situation as if it were real, end quote. And so I found this interesting because that is what totally draws us into comfort content, the feeling like this is real, right? Like this is actually happening to someone who I quote unquote know, Uh, and not in a creepy way. So kind of like those um, streams that you're talking about, Mm -hmm. but just in a really intentional way on the creator's part. So that's like a really key factor too, that it's something they're producing on purpose. So they kind of call the shots in terms of these parasocial relationships. And so in that case, it is another, it's like another dimension to creating community that we never had before the rise of the internet and social media. Yes. Now this all leads into something called escapism. And I think it's so interesting that we're going to talk about this considering we just did like a two-parter on imagination. (laughs) And one of the words we didn't want to really get into then was escapism. (laughs) Because we're like, this isn't escapism. We're happy with our lives. We're just using our imaginations as tools to enhance our lives. Um, But I was looking more into escapism with this because um, there's a, a fascinating study that was done in 2021 called Loneliness, escapism, and identification with media characters and exploration of the psychological factors underlying binge watching tendency. <laughs> okay. Got okay. that? Yeah. <laughs> Very heavy. I skimmed it. I'll just be really clear. Okay. I just skimmed this thing. Um, 
But they did really look into, well, first of all, they really spent a lot of time trying to identify exactly what binge watching is. Is it intentional? Is it mm. accidental? Or, you know, like they had to really figure out what that is as well. Um, and they were all in agreement, all of the experts that, um, you know, that there was a lot of um, potential for negative outcomes with our mm -hmm. unhealthy attachments to these media figures and these content creators. Um, however, they did point out many of the positive benefits of the internet. Like um, they said, the internet helps connect the world and several studies showed that it is associated with many positive outcomes, such as the maintenance of social capital, the perception of greater social support and the satisfaction of the need to belong when offline relationships are not available. And again, that totally mm -hmm. makes sense over these last two Two years that there would be an increase of these parasocial relationships and are turning to content creators to provide comfort. Now, some of the positive aspects of escapism, according to the website terraskills.com, uh, they say that it can increase happiness, become a source of creativity. So when we escape into books or a podcast, we can have a eureka movement that inspires mm -hmm. us to do something creative, right? Um, it mm -hmm. can motivate us like cleaning videos, which again, we'll get to in a minute, and that it is therapeutic. But then unhealthy escapism tends to procrastination I think we can all <laughs> admit to that oh, uh -huh. no. <laughs> right uh, a denial of reality right we can get so mm. deeply into some things that we start to deny reality and then they said that can turn um, we can also dig our heels in really tightly on some opinions and stuff uh, and then of course addiction um, mm. but the, yeah a lot of this goes really into this idea of escapism when we are turning to these things to just take us for 20 minutes out of our lives um, so yeah I, I see the positive benefits of that. Yeah, me too. Like a lot of these things, I wonder if it's because there's so much and so much of it is new. So it's like an uncertainty or a wariness of new things mm -hmm. that we feel we want to put a distance between ourselves and things like escapism and um, ASMR videos yeah, and like yeah, all yeah. these different things, right? But And video games streaming, like that can't possibly yeah. be good for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're still trying to figure yeah. it out. You're right. It is mm -hmm. so new. Yeah, but like what you were saying is that it's, um, it doesn't have to be like if we can keep it in its proper context, these are actually really interesting and amazing things. And it's a part of our world. Um, so I, I think we were talking earlier about how the younger generation seems to have a much better handle on mm -hmm. a, a great sense of how to use these things well, Yeah, um, probably because they grew up with it. It's not novel to them in the same way that it's novel to us um and i yeah i love the idea of moderately used escapism yes. i'm just going to coin that term right yes, perfect <laughs> like, actually they call it there was a term escapism. hold on let me oh, go is there? yeah it's called low maintenance low maintenance escapism oh, so there right you go. and i like yes. that i think that makes sense <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah where it's not dominating you yeah um but yeah i mean like just to kind of turn off your mind a little bit it's a it, I wonder if it could be considered a form of rest oh totally uh, letting our brains just off the hook for like 20 minutes here go and live this yeah. <laughs> for a few seconds um, so I've said before that one of the only content creators that actually help my frantic brain relax is Hammy Mommy. And yeah. um, that those 20 minutes of her videos, oh my goodness, they do put me into a trance. And so she falls into that category of, they're called clean with me videos. Um, now, I believe I was one of the pioneers of the clean with me videos. <laughs> <laughs> I believe you were. Uh, yes, thank you very definitely. much. Uh, back mm -hmm. in 2015, when Facebook lives were still new, I started doing live cleaning videos of my homeschool room. Um, and so this is before Instagram even had all that available. And there was a huge response when I started showing like a messy room and then how I would clean it. And I never understood the draw for the people watching it until I found some that I love watching. <laughs> like Hammy <laughs> Mommy. Um, yeah. But I do many a clean with me video on Instagram and, and have for years. Now, according to an article on why we love watching other people clean, there's an article on bustle.com and quote, cleaning videos have been trending on YouTube long before high production value shows made their way to Netflix. They're referencing like um, the organizational shows in Marie Kondo. Um, it goes on mm -hmm. to say vloggers figured out that uh, a time-lapse pickup session set to cheerful soundtrack is an easy win with viewers as many of these videos have over a million views each. 
TikTok has its own subset of cleaning fanatics called Clean Talk, where videos and hashtags like hashtag clean with me, hashtag cleaning talk, and hashtag organize it have amassed billions of views. The combination of gentle noises, repetitive motions, and dirty to clean transformations captivate viewers and spark psychological delight, end quote. Mm, psychological delight is exactly what I experience mm -hmm. when I watch Hammy Mummy. <laughs> yep. And all those things. That is that is so interesting that it is uh, um and across borders, like across generations, like it's the clean with me videos in particular. Yeah. Um and the domestic arts, right? This is and the cooking videos and yes. like all those kinds of things. Like yeah. that is something that really resonates on a like on a deeper level than perhaps a lot of other things. Like it's the rising um it's the rising form of comfort content of what we've been talking about this episode, right? Yeah. And I think it's so fascinating because it's something you and I have been talking, making that content and talking about these things long before the pandemic. And I kind of yeah. love that, I, obviously, I'm not being glib here when I say that, that some benefits came out of the pandemic. Other people have acknowledged this too. And one of the things was that people really did fall in love with home again. Um, people who've never yeah. had to be at home had to be at home. And they talk about this in this um, article. Another one in the New York Times actually um, talks about how home was the only safe place and the outside world was literally untouchable. And the urge mm. to tidy is so satisfying. These are people who never had the time before. And and yep. so, and, but you and I have had the time for many years and we've, we've <laughs> always talked about how wonderful this is. So it's been kind of wonderful seeing, um, the non-Catholic homemaker or non-Christian homesteader world, like kind of the secular world, like kind of come mm -hmm. into our space and, yeah. and, and really enjoy it as well. Um, because we do think it's wonderful and we do find that watching those videos does add, um, well, psychological delight and value to the jobs and that we're doing every day to our duties. Like we, we watch someone else do it and we go, this is wonderful. Look at her transforming that space. I can do this too. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, it's just been something that we find inspiring and pleasurable to watch. Yeah. And I think that that's the reason why the clean with me in particular videos are so inspiring is exactly what she said is watching it and saying, I can do that. Mm -hmm. Right. It's um, I think it, we said this before earlier in the episode is because when we watch those videos, uh, we watch it and we say, I can do that. Yeah. I, because I have the space. I have a space that I can tidy. Yeah. Right. And so it gives that kind of, um, you know, we have this need to do something and to accomplish something and nurturing something is often really natural to us, especially in times of uncertainty. And so the domestic arts gives a creative outlet for that need. And I think watching someone else do it first, we didn't feel so alone yeah, yeah. <laughs> when we then went and did those things ourselves. And then second, we wanted, um, either instruction on how to do it or we were inspired by how to do it in a relaxed beautifying yes. kind of a way <laughs> yeah, I just think about what I look like when I'm cleaning and like That's what... <laughs> right yes it, it's very different the way they do it yes <laughs> yeah yeah because we've kind of forgotten that you can yeah like do it in this in this kind of a way and I yep. think the the transformation that happens on the screen from dirty to clean is really like inspiring for us. We're always inspired by like new beginnings and starting fresh and all these things. And here are, here is video content. Um, and you can watch as much of it as you need to, to get the sense of like, I can make this happen in my own life too. And then you turn around and it doesn't seem quite as daunting or quite as intimidating or as scary when you know someone else somewhere out there is doing the same thing. And I just think it's so fascinating that these typically feminine domestic skills, the bread making, the cleaning, um, the gathering eggs from the chickens in the morning, the gardening, you know, all of these things, um, these things even three or four years ago um, weren't celebrated by the culture and they're somehow amassing millions of views. And so there's obviously like this return, uh, maybe to a type of admiration for these skills, even if people don't want to do them themselves. I think they're seeing mm -hmm. these traditional female roles in a domestic sense in a new light. And that's really exciting for me because let me just tell you, and I'm sure I shared the story before in the podcast, but years ago I hashtagged housewife. And mm. back then that hashtag was only used for pornography. 
which I mm. accidentally found out when I clicked on it. No one was tagging homemaking, ha- like nobody. And this was only a couple of years ago. Um, and so um, to know that this, that so many millions of people are tuning in to just watch a woman with a couple of children at her feet at her island, making something quietly and cleaning up. I just love that we're kind of seeing it through new eyes again. Um, mm-hmm. That's given me just such joy and pleasure. And you know what? After talking now about comfort content and comfort creators, basically all I want to do right now is go and watch something Mm -hmm. (laughs) on YouTube. And so if you've never checked out this wonderful corner of the internet before, maybe tonight would be a good time to start and go and take in some of the beautiful things that people out there are creating that show us how to be in the present moment how to relax and unwind, how to appreciate the things that we have in our own everyday lives and let them inspire you to look around your own life and be inspired and motivated to make it happen here and now. Okay, it's time for our What We're Loving This Week segment of the show. So Lindsay, what have you been loving this week? Well, I don't actually have a specific answer this week, but it's rather something more general. Um, I Mm. have discovered that I love watching whatever my 13-year-old son will watch if it means that he'll spend time with me. And I'm not just trying to be sentimental here. Um, You know, he's the only one of my four kids who enjoys a good movie, TV show, or documentary. Um, And while we have some overlap of our tastes, he loves space and math and science and sci-fi. And (laughs) frankly, those aren't my go-to topics and genres. (laughs) But over the last couple of days, um, I watched a 2002 movie with Christian Bale called um, Equilibrium uh, with him Mm. and a new show called Alien Worlds. And uh, yeah, those wouldn't have been my first choices. And they were okay to watch. Like they were better than okay. Uh, But Mm -hmm. having him leaning on my shoulder, watching something with his mama, I mean, I will continue to watch whatever he likes over and over again. Uh, Mm. It's more important than what I like any day of the week. So that's what I'm loving this week. Mm. Oh, I love that. And you know what? I do love too that like when you were homeschooling, yeah, he did get such a great glimpse into the world of your interests yes. and things like that. Yeah. And now it's kind of like he's returning the favor yeah, and yeah. he's letting you get a glimpse into what kinds of things he loves too. Yeah. And that that's such a, an amazing strengthening um, bond activity for you guys. Yeah, it's been wonderful. So what have you been loving this week? Well, I have been loving watching the PBS masterpiece show, All Creatures Great and Small. Ah. Yeah. And I didn't think I would because it's about a country vet in yeah. England in the mid-1900s. And I was like, uh, I think I tried to read the book once yeah. and didn't get into it for some reason at the time. Um, but the show is based on kind of an autobiographical book series by a man named James White who writes about his own experiences as a veterinary surgeon from the 1930s in Yorkshire under the pen name of James Harriet. So the TV series is actually a great example of comfort content, Mm -hmm. in my opinion. It's lighthearted, it's humorous, it's heartwarming. Um, But, you know, there's enough of a plot that you do become invested in the lives of James, his boss, Mr. Farnan, and his younger brother, the villagers, and, of course, the importance of the health and upkeep of animals that were critical to your life (laughs) in small rural communities at the time. So because it's a PBS Masterpiece production, you can expect like beautiful scenery and videography, good storytelling, and an immersive kind of entertainment experience. We just finished watching season one last weekend, and we're already into season two. We all love it. My kids love it. And it's something that we've all been really enjoying together. So yeah, we've been watching TV together too, and it is a great bonding experience. Love it. And to get them started on comfort viewing now, right? It's just, Mm. it is, it just creates a whole wonderful family atmosphere. I have wanted to watch that show for forever and I keep forgetting about it. So I will do that now. Thank you. Okay. That's going to do it for us this week. If you want to get in touch and chat with us about our topic today, you can find us on our website, www.themodernlady1950.wordpress.com or leave us a comment on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube where you can find us at The Modern Lady Podcast. 
I'm Michelle Sachs, and you can find me on Instagram at MM Sachs. And I'm Lindsay Murray, and you can find me on Instagram at Lindsay Homemaker. Thank you so much for listening. Have a great week, and we will see you next time. Mm